I hated life. And I have yet to meet someone that hated life like me. Like I wanted nothing to do with the next breath of my lungs. Just to get high and steal from people, steal cars, started selling drugs. And next thing I know, I'm shooting up coke, molly, meth. I would mix them all together. And then I started doing heroin. I've had to be restrained multiple times because of my aggression. I'm punching trees, punching walls. My God, I was just lunatic. I was done. I was ready to quit. What was God in my recovery? Everything. It's been a supernatural thing. It's been something eternal that he's done in me. He's flipped the switches. Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior, that's my, he's my success story. Like, he's the reason I'm here today. I put in the work and I put in the effort, but he did the transformation of my heart. And I'm only here and alive because of him. Like, there, I, honestly, I couldn't even tell you to pinpoint what happened other than like God touched my heart. And like, once you taste that, there's no, there's no other taste. God has been the, my root of my success, bro. And like, I truly believe with all my heart, like there is no happiness in my life without him. Like there is no, there is no if, ands, or buts. So like he was the most important role to my recovery because I understood that I wouldn't recover without him. He was my recovery. He is my end game. He is my everything to make my steps forward to being sober the rest of my life. I mean, he comes for everybody, but he loves the people who are unwanted. He loves the people who are really broken because those are the ones he does the greatest things through. The greatest things. I'm Ty Bateman. I'm from Denver, Colorado. I'm 23 years old, and this is my story. Um, so my biological father left me at nine months old, moved back to Hawaii with another female, never heard from him again, really. Um, I was raised in a good Christian home, uh, knew about Jesus, kind of just was just implemented in my house. Um, I was real athletic up until the ages of nine. My world got turned upside down. Um, I played sports, you know, soccer, basketball, all prior to that, and even during this. Um, at the ages of nine, I was molested and raped by a man for a year. And um, that did a lot of damage to me because I was only nine years old, you know what I mean? And so, and I was bullied a lot in school, and I just couldn't make any friends, and no one liked me, and all these different little things. So, like, it just, it shut my whole world out. And because of that, I started having seizures. Um, kids would make fun of me because of my seizures which caused me just to continue to go on a downhill slope. Um, I eventually started hating life. I started hating God. Um, I started just cursing and hating everybody. By the age of 10, I attempted my first suicide attempt. You know, during ages of 11, 12, and 13, I was continuously in and out of mental hospitals, um, constantly, you know, threatening to kill myself, was constantly cutting myself. Um, it, it was just tragic because I just couldn't, I couldn't have friends. I just couldn't fit in. I couldn't, wasn't good enough or I wasn't this. And so that just played with my young mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just sucked. Um, by ages of 13, we moved houses and moved into Littleton. Um, I ran into a bad small group of kids that smoked weed and cigarettes. And I got myself involved in that because it felt good. I wanted to be part of the cool kids or the bad kids or, you know what I mean? Somewhere that I thought I fitted in, you know? And uh, so I still just couldn't, I just couldn't make friends, man. Started joining the wrestling team. That was cool, you know, just continuously, again, still in and out of hospitals. Between the ages of 15 and 16, I got sent to multiple like little rehab things or clinics, went to one in San Diego, got kicked out of there, went to the one in Utah, which was a wilderness program. You know, I was still causing trouble in there, ran away. And like anything I try to do to try to quote unquote help myself, just turn back <laughs> like, all the time. Um, I was constantly like verbally abusive to my family. I would constantly bicker with my mom. I've had to be restrained multiple times because of my aggression. I'm punching trees, punching walls, punching holes in my wall, you know, just causing 
massive amounts of mischief. And because I started getting high, I'm starting to um, steal stuff and unlock cars, air out their tires, um, just do a whole bunch of bad things, you know what I mean? Made honor roll, joined the wrestling team, played football, swam during the summer, you know, continued to stay in sports, but I just wasn't happy. Didn't want nothing to do with anybody, didn't nothing want to do with my family. Um, sophomore year, I dropped out of high school, went to several different other little schools to try to get back on track and got kicked out of those. I just I wasn't doing good, so then I officially dropped out, and that was that. Um, on May 11th, 2017, I, um, my mom went to go take my sister to school, and my buddies were with me. We just got done smoking weed and stuff, and uh, he, um, I told him, I looked at him, and I was like, hey, I'm going to go kill myself, bro. And... Um, my mom went to go take her to school and gave me enough time. I ran down in the basement. I already had cord braided and ready to go. Tied the noose and went in, and I remember looking back at my friend and was like, hey, this is it, bro, I'm done. And like, he didn't even, didn't even budge, didn't care. And I kicked the ladder from underneath myself, and I died. Um, My mom came back and my little sister, who's five years younger than me, came back, opened the garage, and I'm, I'm hanging from the rafters. And um, my mom, I can't even tell you how she felt. She, uh, she cut me down, cried to the neighbors, and the neighbors called the ambulance and stuff and got to the hospital. I was eight minutes legally dead, no, no brain recovery, no heart, nothing. and. Uh, so that I was on, you know, in the ICU, they had to like put these machine on you to like slow your, try to bring your brain back and your heart back. And they had a machine on my heart to keep it beating. Um, and I was, and then I finally woke up and I was pissed. I was pissed that I lived. I was so mad. Like I wanted nothing, I wanted everything. I was like, finally my misery's gone. And instead I got to live and I was pissed out about it. Um, by this point, I've already started experiencing with meth and um, from some buddies of mine. And uh, after I got out of the hospital, I stayed like a week in Denver Health as like a mental institute. Also later on that year, I found out that I had two more siblings, Kawi and Ali'i. And um, that's how I got in contact with my dad for the first time. I ripped him a new one for just leaving me high and dry my, most of my life and leaving me with abandonment issues. and you know, not having my, my my dad in my life, you know? Uh, Kawi and Lily, I got to hang out with them for a little bit, and then their mom disowned me because of what I've been through in my past. So I got pushed out of their lives. So like, just life was just horrible. After the hospital, I continued to do meth and do any drug that I could possibly get entwined with. I've done acid, shrooms, molly, ecstasy, DMT, PCP, you know what I mean? You name it, I've done it, heroin, and so, you know, I've done all those and continue to do meth. By the age of 18, my mom was like, hey, either you're gonna do this or you're not. I chose to go to the streets. Uh, I started off in my like own little neighborhood for a little bit. And um, after that, I moved on to downtown. I was just a straight fiend. I would do anything other than sell my body to get high. You know what I mean? I didn't care what weather it was. I didn't care this or that. I just wanted to be high. And um, at that time, I was shooting meth. You know, I never really smoked it, so I used an IV needle and just put masses of amounts of dope into my veins. And um, throughout all that, just continue to like I'd hurt people, man. Uh, I would, you know, there's a dude that looked at me wrong, and I took my skateboard trucks and hit him over the back of the head, and then whipped out a baton and just beat his head in until he finally walked off the block. And I said, bro, if you ever come back, I'll kill you. And I meant it, and I seen him again, and uh, he was like, hey, uh, you remember me? I was like, yeah. He's like, this is from you, and he had a scar from his forehead to the back of his head that hair can't grow back because he had to get surgery. And I was like, yeah, and I got, you, should, you should leave, you know what I mean, before that happens again. You know, and I just became, because I hated life so much and that I lived, I became very violent. You know, you look at me wrong or you do me dirty, I'm coming after you. 
you know, I've been pistol whipped, I've been robbed, I've been beaten up in my sleep, I've been stabbed, I've been this, this, and that. You know what I mean? My scars on my face are from a bottle. You know, I've had like a Molotov cocktail thrown at me, I've, you know? And so, you know, just because I've been through all these things and people out to get me, I was out to get them. I was bloodthirsty. And, you know, that's the scariest part is just knowing that you have that inner demon in you. You know what I mean? That you have that much hate and that much anger that you're willing to take another than one, someone else's life for it. And by God's grace, I, no one was smart enough to give me a gun because I was freaking crazy on drugs. My mom will come see me once a week and take me out for a hot meal, give me hand warmers, clothes. And then uh, I tried to push her away. I was like, Mom, I'm, I'm your son's dead. Like, my name's Tweak. Like, don't call me Ty. Don't call me your son. Like, I don't want you ever to see me again. And then she's like, Boy, you're my you're my baby boy, and I, I'm not I'm not going anywhere. And uh, that for me, that hit it. You know, like I couldn't. I just broke down crying because I didn't know. I like, what do you do with that? Showing that, like, she, I've given her every reason to give up on me, and she hasn't. I continued on the streets. You know, I lived with my buddy Trouble in his garage with his family and just continued to get high and steal from people, steal cars. And then eventually I started selling drugs. And then I started doing heroin. And next thing I know, I'm shooting up anything that could liquefy and go in my veins. Coke, molly, uh, meth, I would mix them all together, whatever. I just didn't care. You know, um, I never OD'd on heroin, thankfully. I've gotten really close. Um, but it's been, you know, it was rough. You know, I, I know what it's like to have nothing, no clothes. And then when you're homeless, everyone looks at you like you're a freaking alien and doesn't care whether you live or die. You know what I mean? You could ask for help and no one cares. You know what I mean? And so, like, I've been on both sides of the track. I know what it's like to have some stuff, and I definitely know what it's like not to. And... Um, it just sucked. It was horrible. Um, eventually, I finally got locked up in November of 2019, and I thought I was done. Ended up getting back out, and um, I wasn't done. I uh, lived at home, tried to work a job for a little bit, but I got right back in with the wrong people, which led to me getting high again. The difference about me when I fell off this time is I didn't get as high. Instead, I just sold good good amount of drugs. You know what I mean? And because I sold a good amount of drugs, I just kept the money flow and went and sold drugs. And then I would sleep every night, go eat some real food. And because of that, like, I just I just slept every night. I was so done. I was tired of having to look over my shoulder all the time. Like, that's no fun. It's no fun whether you're, you're going to get killed in your sleep or whether you're going to have anything next to you when you wake up. You know, it's it's petrifying, bro, and, you know, you're going to get cold when it rains and you're going to freeze when it snows, and you don't have no warm place to go. You know, you don't have no dry clothes to put on afterwards. You don't have nothing. And because I moved so much, all I had was what was in my backpack, and sometimes I didn't even have those. You know, so I was constantly just in misery. I've gotten pistol whipped, you know. Dude came up to the car and was like, hey, I need everything. And like after that's when I told my mom, I was like, I'm gonna kill this dude. I'm done, I'm done. I'm gonna kill this dude. And then she was just like, no, Ty, don't do that to yourself, you know? And then so, you know, it continued. And then finally, eventually, <sighs> April 25th of 2020, I finally got re-locked up. Um, some dude randomly called the cops on me and I was kind of like in a conversation with him like, Man, I'm ready to be done. And just out of God's grace, it's like, you're ready to be done. And got me locked up, which is where I needed to be. You know, that's how I see it. And God was like, I'm going to have this random dude call the police on him so he can go to jail. So he can be safe. So his mom's heart is at ease, you know. And so I sat in Douglas for like about a week. And just, you know, I, again, I attempted to try to and take my own life. I tried to take the towel and choke myself out. And... um I really didn't want to die, but I was just so done so much, and so hurt and so mad at myself that I didn't, you know, I was, I was just done. I threw in the towel. And so then they transferred me to Jefferson County Jail, and uh, that's where everything changed. Ended up in a pod with a guy. 
that I didn't like and ended up getting a fight and kicking out of that got kicked out of there and moved to another pod where I met where I met my boy Trivi. You know, I just got out of fight, I'm just like a hot mess. And I seen how he worked out and then he led a prayer circle one night. And um he had a prayer circle about forgiveness, and in that moment, I lost everything. I just broke down crying, and he came up to me. He's like, what's going on, my bro? I was just like, I'm hurting, bro. Like, I need help. And I went up to them in the mob closet and was like, hey, bro, how do I do this? Like, how do I forgive? Like, how, how do I talk to God about this? Like, I feel so ashamed and so shameful. Like, what do I, you know, what do I do? Because I've had a heart in the heart my whole life of just hate and anger. And like every other emotion was numb to me. I was so mad at God. And like any time my mom said that he loved me, I couldn't believe it. I was like, there's no way. Look what everything I've gone through. How does he love me? So then I tried to find it in other people. And then I tried to find it in drugs. But my heart's always been looking to fill that void. But I couldn't come to myself to reason that God was it. So I've looked everywhere but. And the only last place I didn't look was God. And then when I heard that I was forgiven, and I've heard it before, but like there's a certain season, certain things hit, you know what I mean? And then when to hear that I'm forgiven for hurting other people, for taking other people's car when maybe they had to take someone to the hospital, almost killing people, taking their stuff, getting high, disrespecting my family, and the people he told me that I'm supposed to be obedient to and I have it, and told me that I'm still loved just as much and no less, turns everything. It's like, how? It's because he loves you that much. And when he took my heart and heart and turned it to flesh, man, it was just like transforming, allowing me to feel things again, allowing me not to be numb allowing me not to hate, but he showed me who I had to forgive because it's holding me back. Yeah, you're forgiven, but make that first step of faith. That's faith right there, forgiving other people because then you're forgiven. And like knowing that I'm forgiven and that's one thing that's asked of me, what do I have to lose? Okay, I'll take that step. And everything changed. I don't hate the man that molested me no more. I pray for him. I want him to have a healthy, better life. The same reason why Jesus wants me to have a better life, because I'm forgiven. That's how love works. And that's the most impactful thing in my life. I found everything that I was looking for in an instant, instantaneous. I was consumed. I felt worthy. I felt full felt satisfied for once, all because I surrendered my life to Him. And that just comes to show that you can chase anything in this world and you will find always emptiness. You could be a, a millionaire, still won't be satisfied. There's always that certain longing for something deeper and there's nowhere to find it but in God and in faith. And people have faith twisted. Like they don't have an understanding of what it is. Religion outside of like Christianity is like, you have to do this, this, and this, and then you'll be saved. To where God's like, Christianity's like, bro, just come here, son. Come here. Let me give you a hug. Let me love you. Let me take care of you. Here, your heart's full now. You're filling with the Holy Spirit. You're overflowing, bro. Your cup is full. Like from that point on, as soon as that day on, I became on fire for the Lord. I wanted to know more. I was hungry. I was hungry for what he had to say. I was hungry to learn. I was hungry to hear and listen. And like, ever since that forgive me peace, bro, that, it was over, bro. I heard it and something turned in my heart and I lost it. I don't know what it was about the Bible. He said, you need to get in it and you need to start reading, bro. If you want to grow in this, start. And he said, start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels. So I started reading and I read the Psalms and I read the Proverbs and and slowly but surely, God would show me new things. And he would speak to me through them. You know, what he did through Paul. You know, like my best friend Trivi, he was my Paul in my life. The man became a role model for me. 
in every aspect of just showing me what it means to be a godly man, show me what it is to dive in the word, what to look for, how to, how to break down the scriptures, how to apply it to my life, how to step on my own two feet and represent the man upstairs, you know? And then eventually I started working out with them and the next thing I know I'm eating dinner with them every, night, every meal and, and just spending more and more time with them and learning from him and learning through God and allowing the transformation to happen, you know? Next thing I know, I'm leading prayer circles. The next thing I know, I'm leading worship. And the next thing you know, I'm writing my own poetic little things about my life. And next thing I know, I'm praying over people in the pod. And next thing I know, I'm sending dudes who are pagan down and having Bible study and speaking life into them when they were had every reason to go against me, in which they did. And they tried to, and I continued to show and pursue, and God pierced their heart, man. And so my role was, how can I push this message out? Who can I go talk to? How can I be an example on a prison yard? So that was my role. And because of that role, I touched several people's hearts. I changed a 40-year-old, 44-year-old man's heart because I was just used as a tool. He's like, bro, I've never had like a 22-year-old change my life before. Not me, bro, I'm just a tool. And because I had the willingness to be a tool, God played. He's like, I bet, Let me, let's do this, son. That was the nail and he's the hammer, you know, cause he's putting that force through me to implement and to pursue whatever needs to be done. And by doing that and living that, you're doing exactly what God made you to do. And that's to be a fisherman, amen. That's to help and guide people and strengthen people and bring more people to him. That's for you to have the same power that he had in Jesus to go and heal people. God's given us a lot of power and a lot of authority over the evil things in this world. Utilize that for his good, because that's what it's about. So I finally get to go home, bro, and I got home and like we left. I went to IHOP was the first place I wanted to go and got me some country fried steak. And so as soon as I got out, my mom got me my electrical job. Started becoming an electrician. Turns out I love it. And so I'm starting to work full time. My grandma helped me buy a car. You know, so now I got a car. I've never had my driver's license. So I went and got my driver's license. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to work more, get the experience that I needed. Just doing everything I loved, bro. Started going to the mountains, started fishing. Got a girlfriend eventually. Went and visited my grandpa's grave and just, you know, just allowing myself to feel and live life, bro. And like nothing has in a sense gone wrong because I've had God in my life. Everything is that much better with God in it. And it's a lot more special. And so like my life has changed in every way. I view things different. I got wisdom and knowledge that are way past who I am, you know what I mean? Like, and I say that humbly of just like, I've been, I've been blessed with certain things and power behind it. And then now I have that story to tell to those people who have been molested, to those people who have struggled with suicide, who do battle drug addiction, who have been homeless, who have been in prison. Like I have all these things and so many different areas to touch lives. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I can go to a suicidal person. Cool, I can go to a drug addict. I can go to this person and be able to relate 110% with them and be able to speak on how I got through it, how, how I struggled, where my mindset was at, and how what God did. Because I promise you, His word never comes back void, and boy, once that word gets in you, it's game over for you. Hearing, like even hearing my story talk, I don't even know how to wrap my mind around how that happened, because it's not it's not human, bro. Like what happened is not human. It's not nothing I did. I put in the work and the hard work and the dedication, and he did the rest, bro, to get me to the where the mindset that I have now. I believe wholeheartedly that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it is living and active. My transformation didn't happen in any other book. It happened in the Bible. My, my, I'm sober and alive because of what God said in the Bible. Look what it does to people. Look what it did to me. It cut me up, spit me out in the whole nine drawings and I'm a whole new person because of it. You know what I mean? He sat there with a the chisel and breaking off my impurities in the furnace. Cause that's what happens when you put gold in a furnace, it burns off all the impurities and that's what I did in prison. I was in the furnace. And he was burning off all my impurities because I was willing to get in the Word of God and because it's living and active. It's not even a self-help book. It's a how-you-live book. 
Like the Holy Bible is a prime example of what God will do through the sick and the messed up. Not because they did anything right, I promise you that much. They did everything wrong. And God moved through them to do right. Why not open your heart to listen? Like for me, I was very open to listen. So what's, what's, what's the point on keeping your guard up on something, bro? Instead of trying it out. And like majority of the time that answer is because I, I, I hate him or I'm mad at him. Ah, see, there it is. Been where I've been. Frustrated because you don't know why. But yet again, try to figure out why and pray and ask him for it. He says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be open to you. Ask him so he can show you. And I promise you, on everything I love, he will do so. God made man and woman to be good, to have a good life until sin was born in this world, and which now has made us corrupt in a sense, you know what I'm saying? And he came for us because we are so broken. Because if we weren't broken, why would he come? You know what I mean? If we were perfect, why would he send a, a perfect man to show us what needs to be done if we're already perfect? Wouldn't we have a good life all the time? Wouldn't everything just be peachy? But it's not. We're broken because we're all deceived by our own sinful natures and because we continuously turn the opposite direction of Jesus. Because we're so wrapped up in our own pride, ego, you name it, sinful desires, that we're just like, all the la vista, you know what I mean? We turn away from him and he's like, I made you to fall back on me. I made you to fully commit and surrender and submit to me so that I can carry you through this and carry you back home. Carry you where you belong. Like you don't have to be that broken all the time. You're human, duh, you're gonna make dumb decisions, but like I'm here to like help you get through that. Like I'm your ultimate therapist. I'm just waiting up here waiting for you. Cause I know your heart, you know what I mean? So I know your heart, I know you're waking up, I know it before you speak, I know every word before it, and I know every hair on your head. And I'm here to help you through anything, cause I can do anything. Cause I'm the one that paid for everything. The one that knows your name. The one who created everything for you to enjoy. I know you intimately, but I want you to know me intimately. You know what I mean? And that's what people forget. That he doesn't just put in the work, you do too. He wants that love. He wants you to taste that. He wants you to love that. He wants you to chase after him. Because that's how he's made you to be. He sent a perfect man to help the broken people. His children. To lead them back to him. And by so he sent this, his son, Jesus Christ, lives an example of what you should be doing. And then paid the ultimate sacrifice for all your wrongdoings for eternity because that's how much he loves you. Despite how much we curse him, despite how much we tear him down, despite how much we do this, this, and this, and don't listen, we have given him every reason not to help pick us up, and that's called grace. That's unmerited favor. That's getting what you don't deserve because that's how much he loves you. That's that mercy. That's that authentic love that he has for you. Shoot, you sin and you lie to me and you do this to me and you keep things from me and this, this, and this. God's still there at your worst when you don't deserve it. And that's what that cross represents. No hesitation. Love. Sacrifice. And grace. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that's what I see is love. A love that we will never wrap our minds around. As he was hanging from the cross, you know, he was like, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And let it be finished. It's finished. It's paid for. If, if that's not sacrifice and that's not love in your eyes and that's not grace, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. It's a free gift, unmerited favor. You don't deserve anything. I <laughs> you don't deserve anything. But I give it to you willingly because I love you. And because I love you, I want you to come spend eternal life with no condemnation, with no pain, with no tears, with no suffering. 
with me at no cost. Just choose to surrender your life and give your life to Christ Jesus and say, I'm yours. I believe and I receive with all my heart because God, is that's what he made you for. Because once you've tasted that and you can wrap your mind around that, there's nothing better. There's nothing better. There's no better taste. Like that cup is not full if you don't have God in your life. You're constantly gonna be wondering, questioning, lost. But once that cup's full, you're not questioning nothing no more. You might question like why this is happening in your life in that season, but your approach is completely different and so is your perspective because your cup's full. You have all these different branches that bear fruit, like the fruits of the Spirit. And you got all of these ones of trusting Him and getting intimate with Him and the Word living and active and this, this, and this. It starts with faith. Taking that step back and being like, it is true. I do believe. I do receive Him as my Lord and Savior. Like, you know what I mean? Heaven or hell, bro, you pick. You know what I'm saying? Because if you go in the opposite direction, he's sitting there waiting like, bro, I have this for you. I have this for you. But you have your own decisions to make. He didn't force me. He sat there and waited patiently until I heard or something clicked in me was like, my turn, son. You've turned to me. Sin is so deceptive and so like grabbing. And God's so patient and still to where Satan does so much moving around and God waits and allows you to make that decision. You know what I'm saying? Which, which is the game changer. That's where like the human choice and free will comes into play because, you know, what are you, what are you gonna do? There's no growth from sin, there's no this. Like all those things are just distractions because they look good from the enemy and take us away from the one thing that we need to keep focused on for a fulfilled life. Not even just a fulfilled life, eternal life at that. If you stay laser focused on me, and you don't look here, you don't look left, you don't look right, and you stay laser focused on me, I promise you, you're gonna have everything you could ever want and you're gonna be fulfilled. You know, just like he did with, you know, Peter in the boat. Walk out of the boat, walk on water. What did he do? He looked moved in the right, he lost focus and he began to sink. God says, stay focused on me because anything to your left and to your right and behind you is irrelevant. It's sinking sand. You have everything you need on me. When you've became a believer in Christ, you've put away the old. Now it's time to put on the new. Not because of anything you've done, but by everything that he's done in Christ Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And because now you are forgiven, you are, your transgressions are wiped away. You have stepped into a new life and to pick up that cross and carry that. So you, as much as he is willing, you have to be too. And you also have to understand that it's not on your time. Maybe that season's not over. You know what I mean? Maybe there's more you have to gain from it, but give it to him. Because like slowly but surely, he'll, I believe that he'll show you things through those trials and tribulations that will heal you in some way, shape or form. God can heal any wound. Hands down. When? It's not on your watch. How? Not on your watch. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's where faith comes in, man. Because you could be put through a season that lasts long. But you have to have faith and trust that it will be healed. And that there is a greater thing on the other side. Trust him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and he will direct your paths. Lean on your understanding comes with everything in life. Everything. Like that's one of my favorite scriptures because regardless of what's going on in my life, I am not meant to understand why. And I have to trust him with all my heart and not lean on what my human mind can comprehend. And by doing so, he will direct me because he's my lamp onto my feet. You know, and he says to seek my kingdom and my righteousness and everything else will be added to you. So yeah, he heals wounds, all of them. I was dead and it came back to life. I was an addict and died, almost died multiple times. And I'm still here. 
and everything that I've gone through in my past doesn't harbor me. I'm healed. You may not like when or how, but you'll understand when it happens. It doesn't have to be an extravagant thing like prison or drug addiction. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. It could be because you got cheated on. It could be because you got in a car wreck. But there's, there's green on the other side. I mean, there's green pastures and still waters waiting for you. And there is someone, if you don't feel loved, that does love you in a way that none of us humans can love you. And that you have to make that decision to continue to fight for that. Me out of anybody knows what it's like to hurt and be beaten down bad and not feel loved, for sure. But just know that you're not alone and there's always someone you can talk to. And always go to those resources, like me. <laughs> always willing to listen and always willing to help and bend over backwards for you because I know what it's like to be rock bottom. And just know that there's a father out there who's been rock bottom before too and he's waiting to pick you back up too. He just needs that chance. You know what I mean? He just needs your heart. And the coolest thing I look forward to is seeing a bigger picture of what my life really was meant for up there. We look at it through a pin drop, a keyhole, and he looks at it through the whole world and knows it all. And he's like, see, because you did this and this happened to you, you changed and saved this person's life and you don't even know it. And that's why you went through it. And like, that's such an awesome gift to be able to be given is to go spend eternal life with the very man who has kept me alive. And for any of us, that intimacy, to go up there and go kick it with him, you know what I mean? Go play holy games. The fact that it's free and paid for all by one person. He paid for it and he gave it. And people don't know what to do with that because it's a hard thing to wrap your mind around, you know? I went and suffered for you because I want you to come to this with me. That's so cool. That's so powerful. In Romans 1.16, Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Jesus Christ is the only man that could take a broken kid like me and bring him back to life. And he is standing there with open arms, waiting for you to come home to him too.